on this episode of the End of Tourism podcast. Travel writing is the narrative that underpins colonialism, period. It's the story of the world. It's the story of place, and it's told from one point of view, and that has not changed because we have not, by and large, had decolonization, have had decolonization in most of the world that has been colonized. So as long as that narrative is out there, it is going to continue to justify colonialism and all these other forms of power. Welcome to the End of Tourism podcast, Season 3, Invocations. This season features a deeper dive into the crevices of exile, wanderlust, and radical hospitality with diverse authors, activists, and storytellers. For some, tourism can entail learning, freedom, and financial survival. For others, it means the loss of culture, land, and lineage. Our conversations explore the unauthorized histories and consequences of modern travel. These are dispatches from the resistance. You can listen and subscribe via Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or any major podcast platform. You can follow us on social media via the handle The End of Tourism. And if you want to continue to see the project grow, you can support us via our Patreon page at patreon.com slash The End of Tourism. I'll be your host, Chris Christou. On this episode, my guest is Bani Amor, a genderqueer travel writer who explores the relationships between race, place, and power. They are a four-time Voices of Our Nation Arts Foundation fellow with work in CNN Travel, Fodors, and Afar, among others, and in the anthology Outside the XY, Queer, Black, and Brown Masculinity. In our discussion, we looked at travel writing as a narrative that underpins colonialism and the identity crisis that it desperately needs. We consider contemporary social media travel logs, the limits to decoloniality and tourism greenwashing, spiritual or psychedelic tourism, what subversive travel writing looks like, and what travel writing looks like at home. Welcome, Bonnie, to the End of Tourism podcast. It's great to be speaking with you today. You too. Thank you so much for having me on. My pleasure. My pleasure. Would you like to start, perhaps be able to offer our listeners a little glimpse into where you find yourself today and perhaps what the world looks like for you? Well, first, my pronouns are they, them. I'm on the unceded territories of the Muncie, Lenape, Canarsie, and Matinecock in one of the global capitals of tourism, New York City and Queens, New York, one of the most, the most diverse places in the entire planet, especially ethnically, linguistically. Yeah. Mm. It's noisy. It's slightly sunny. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you for, for sharing that with us. And now to start, I'm curious about what drove you towards the fields of travel writing and if your own travels had anything to do with that. Of course. Well, travel is in my veins. It is in almost all of our veins. We're all the products of travel and you know, I come from a family of immigrants who are descendants of the colonized as well as the colonizer. And we left Ecuador, landed in Washington Heights in the 60s. I was born in Brooklyn in the 80s, settled in Queens in the 90s. We've moved all around back and forth and back and forth between place. My father is indigenous Maya from Guatemala. My mom is a white mestiza from Ecuador and my grandmother and all of that you know, white skin. And so our indigeneity is not that far back. And I was raised by my Ecuadorian family. I don't know my father or anything about all that. At home, you know, my mom was an avid reader. She, she is very kind of leftist in comparison to our Roman Catholic, conservative, Ecuadorian, patriarchal family, and a little bit of the black sheep. And she kind of raised us like that. I have two sisters. And so our home was full of books by people of color, Latinas, Spanish and English and Spanglish that were all about immigration and history and the geopolitics, Latin America and all that stuff. And she would encourage me, you know, she would give me books. So I was just kind of mired and surrounded by writing on place from an anti-colonial general kind of perspective. 
so who knows what someone's fate is, if that's even a thing. But I started writing when I was very young, maybe 11 or something or nine, got my first journals and it was just constant, right? I didn't start traveling until I was a teenager. So I was caught up in all kinds of at-risk youth shenanigans, just all of those school to prison pipeline things and all of the conditions, your zip code that landed me where I was. So um, I had no choice but to leave. So I dropped out of high school and I was just on the road and really kind of began a long-term transient lifestyle that was more about lack of stability than going on vacation. That's not something that we did. And yeah, because I was already writing all the time, I was writing when I was on the road. So I never stopped writing. It was a lot of travelogues and all that shit. It wasn't until, you know, since I dropped out of high school, I didn't have money to go to college and all that shit. There was a recession in like 2008. Um, and, you know, I couldn't get a job. It was just harder. <laughs> it was so hard. Because even when I was younger, I could write, you know, off the books. I can do this and that. But like, I couldn't find sex work. Like, I couldn't like, wash dishes. <laughs> like, it was so hard to get a fucking job. Mm-hmm. Um, and right before that, I had gone to Latin America for the first time when I was like 20, 21. I had gone to Ecuador for the first time, met my whole family there. We never had the money. My mom never had the time off. A mother of three kids, single. My mom just raised us to be so proud and so mired in our Ecuadorian culture and history. And in some ways, you know, we all have different experiences. But for me, first of all, this neighborhood, there's a lot of like different names for it because of all the ethnicities of people here. But mm-hmm. we call it Ecuador is one of the ones, Ecuador to New York, because mm-hmm. this is the greatest population of Ecuadorians outside of New York. Even when I was living in Florida with my family, you're living in America, but when I get in home, I'm in Ecuador. So I usually say I was mm-hmm. raised in Ecuador, but the one in New York. So after going to Latin America, you know, I was radicalized at a young age, right? And I was really into community organizing and activism. And I would travel around and do a lot of stuff like that. You know, I traveled to Latin America with my whole minority mentality, and I wasn't kind of ready for a lot of things. For a lot of immigrants or folks who are displaced or stolen, when you go back to places for the first time, which sounds like a contradiction, but is it? Or returning to a place that you've never been. I was like, oh, shit, I'm mad privileged here. I'm in the majority here. People look like me. And there's a lot of like healing that comes with that. But there was a lot of like, I'm in power. I have privilege. And I knew that here in the U.S., but it's a completely different fucking experience. So when I came back to the U.S., I was, of course, writing all of that shit. And I really had to reflect on the ways that I was privileged mixed in with the ways that I was oppressed because I'm still queer and I was traveling while trans at the time. So that experience traveling around Latin America with all those different kind of understandings, kind of having tension, rubbing up against each other in a way that was much more international, that was much more where I had to look within and look at my own history and face a lot of shit that really kind of changed what I wanted to do with my writing. And I had never looked at it professionally. I had never thought that I would be a writer, an author, never considered that. But when I couldn't find a job because of recession, because not having any kind of fucking (laughs) qualifications for most things, I was like, eventually, why don't I travel and write like all these Mm. white dudes do? And just kind of support myself and my ongoing transient lifestyle by doing that. So that's when I broke in and started trying to do it professionally. That's a long answer, but I have to go back to my ancestry always when I talk about that. So definitely my travel is the number one thing that informs my writing. Beautiful. Yeah, it seems that so many of us have these conflicting places in the world and conflicting ancestries as well. And perhaps that complexity can can drive a little bit of a deeper understanding on travel and and where we go, where we are, where we come from. And so, you know, your work more often than not, I think uh, seems to be geared towards or um, espouses kind of decolonial form of travel writing. And I'm wondering first, before we get a little bit deeper into that, if perhaps you could unpack the travel writing world for our listeners and how might we begin to recognize colonial attitudes or perspectives in travel literature and how it might be hidden from us. 
it is a huge question. You know, I have months long courses on this and we only begin mm. to scratch the surface there, but also getting to the root of that. It's a lot to unpack. It's so mm. much to unpack. So travel writing is the narrative that underpins colonialism, period. It's the story of the world. It's the story of place. And it's told from one point of view. And that has not changed because we have not, by and large, had decolonization, have had decolonization in most of the world that has been colonized. So as long as that narrative is out there, it is going to continue to justify and colonialism and all these other forms of power and vice versa. So I stay away from using decolonization as a metaphor. I use more intentional language in my courses with dismantling coloniality in travel writing, dismantling the inner colonizer in travel writing, those kinds of things. Where to start? It's so much. It is like I have five things, but still it's too much. So mm -hmm. where do we start? All right. So when it comes to these conversations of decolonization and travel culture, and all of these words that have become synonymous with decolonization, any kind of form of bettering the canon of travel writing through having some sort of progressive understanding that shit sucks and we have to do better. All of that comes from a focus of looking outward, you know, especially when people travel to the global south. When people think about how do I decolonize travel and place and all that, they're talking about warm, tropical places. They're not thinking about Paris. They're not thinking about decolonizing Brooklyn. <laughs> They're not thinking about any of those things. They're not thinking about the self. It's looking at the other. It's looking at BIPOC, Black, Indigenous, or other people of color and other colonized people as politicized, I think, as politicized identities. And when they come in contact, which is a very important word we'll go back to, with these folks, then it brings up tensions. Then it brings up questions. Then it's like, I feel called out on the internet because this bitch is talking about colonialism and travel and I want to do better, you know, and that's great. But it has to start with the self. It ha you have to look at yourself. The colonizer has to look at himself because all he does in this writing is look at the others. And all we do in tourism is look at the other, you know, just go mm -hmm. see them up close. That, that can be complex, but what we're doing is just looking at people up close and under the guise of kind of learning about them and all these kinds of things. You know, obviously it's a form of consumption and that can happen through literature. So to kind of go back to the origins, travel writing, like I said, is the narrative that justifies tourism and colonialism. Why? Because, you know, the origins of the canon is in contact narrative, so-called point of contact. You know, you had not just settlers, you had all these other folks who were mapping and naming and researching and studying so-called the land and the mountains and the leaves and the fucking, all the resources that come for one reason, and that is for trade. That is so we can colonize this place. And there's this kind of the traveler, not a tourist mentality. You know, you're a botanist or you're an anthropologist or all these different things that these motherfuckers like hundreds of years ago did really fed into scientific racism. It really fed into going to a place and no matter what you saw, there was a pre-existing narrative on what those places were that were just completely wild. You know, mm. Columbus thought he would see Cyclops and three-headed monsters in the water because he read Greco-Roman shit. All of those stories and those people hadn't fucking left. First of all, I'm not saying that no one traveled before colonization. That is something, you know, to note, but that's not what we're going to talk about today. It was the beginning of travel writing as entertainment because these people weren't exactly telling the truth about Black women and places in Africa. They wrote back to the people at home who could not travel, the common folk or whatever, that these were giants, that they were cannibals, that they spoke in gibberish that they had different sized brains and bodies and they were dirty and disgusting and tall tales really kind of creating through narrative a huge distance between different people. Why? Because the European had such a static view of the self so that everyone else, you know, is already inferior. 
by design. Why? Because their intent and their number one agenda there is to enslave those people, to commit genocide of those people so that they could work the land so that the colonizers could trade them. So none of this was innocent, right? None of this was innocent. Those folks traveled on those boats for a reason, all of them. And a lot of them can call themselves writers, but you know, they're the answer of, of this whole So mm. when I look at the history of it and you look at it now, it's fucking identical. It's really not that different. It's not mm. much has changed at all in that whole narrative. And it's really important that we understand the history of that. It's really important that we study and read those right and stuff so that we can locate him, right? The inner colonizer and be like, I sound like that motherfucker, whether he's describing a landscape or describing people. So yes, there's a colonial way to write, I think about everything. And mm. when it comes to dismantling that, again, you have to look at the self your history, your relationship to land, your ancestry. You know, you weren't born today in Kansas or whatever out of nowhere. Your story didn't begin there. Look, I need you to look and see who were the slavers. Like, were your ancestors homesteaders? And by answers, I mean like a grandfather, you know, with a lot of settlers in the U.S., for instance. So you really have to go back and look at that instead of having an understanding that colonialism was bad and I want to do better. It's actually a lot more work than that. To me, I think once you see it, you'll see it everywhere. And that's what I kind of teach my workshops to identify through subtle use of language that once you see it, it's not so subtle because of going back to that stretching of distance between the standard, the default, the dominant, the colonizer and the other and making it so foreign to justify colonization because they are inferior and they're so different and so weird and so strange, but that they are fit for domination. And those places by proxy are because they're just places to extract labor from people and from place. So it's all in there and it hasn't changed and recognizing it is really just the beginning. Yeah, so much there. I mean, I you know I live in a a very popular at the moment anyways tourist city and people come and there's there's no military, right? There's no uh, there's no sense of ongoing conquest. Although the end of the conquest of the Americas was never mentioned or written in any of the history books. We all kind of gather that in the sense that it's ongoing. But you know, it makes me wonder, within this sense of relative ignorance that tourists have when they arrive in a place like this and say, no, you know, it's completely different. It's completely different from what was going on 100 or 200 years ago. And look, everyone can do it. Not everyone, of course, but those with the money, with the privilege. It makes me wonder what level of relative ignorance is also stretched over time through the culture and whether or not those people arriving on shores in the last 500 years, for example, also proceeded with that the inner colonizer was not something that was particularly known or particularly recognizable as such in those times. And another thing in regards to travel writing is literacy, right? Like travel writing specifically is about this particular medium around in the sense that when we go to a bookstore, and even if we see the even if we see travel writing from people who have been visited upon via tourism or via conquest, even if that was possible, it would still kind of have to occur through the medium of writing in the context of the book. And so I wanted to ask you about this, about media in general. In 2023, most tourists don't write about their experiences anymore, but there's still this tendency towards documenting and collecting typically through social media and in online spaces. And I'm curious how you see those perhaps same colonial perspectives arising, not necessarily through writing, but now through other types of media. And if those colonial attitudes are altered uh, through the image or video, for example, or if they remain the same. It's the same old shit. There's, The things that you'll see on travel influencers pages are almost unrecognizable from 
National Geographic in 1888, period. Mm. Almost word for word sometimes. So it's the continuation. And I am a writer and write about writing a lot in travel writing, but I focus very much on travel culture in general. The mass mm. and tourism industry, travel zones where people of different people clash against each other. That's why I think in travel culture tells us everything we need to know about power because of those tensions. It's so stark. It's so black and white. And you see all these poor ass people and all these rich ass people. The tensions are so visible in a picture in a way that it's worth a thousand words and all that bullshit. So the images of brochures and any representation of place from that white supremacist capitalist lens, all is the same narrative. You know, the images, the videos, they only reflect the writing that most of travel writing is advertising copy, is advertorial. Mm -hmm. Most of it is sponsored by a ministry of tourism, by a hotel, by this and that. So it has always been there to sell. The image and the caption is always there to sell. And the hallmarks of, like, like I said before, gazing at the other, there's a lot that we can recognize there because the images are the same. I would like for them not to be. And maybe 10 years ago, it was like, oh, social media. Now we can have a voice. Now I can talk about this on Twitter and not just these academic folks. What is the path to understanding this shit and travel writing? Like, you should never Google how to travel ethically in Peru. Like, you should look up what's happening with politics there or activists there and do they fucking want you to come at all? I just don't think that's a good way to look mm-hmm. at it. You know, how do I how do I write about this place in a better way? The travel medium is not meant for us to challenge it. So you're gonna have to go elsewhere to look at that. That's just what I have to say about that. So it's the same. They're sponsored by the same exact people. They sell the same exact things. They use the same exact words. It's unfortunate that the evolution of the status quo and how they continue to appropriate all these kind of like progressive words or something extremely radical like decolonization when they're doing and saying the same exact shit. Um, yeah, you don't have to be white. You don't have to be a man. When it comes to travel, whether it was, you know, the colonizers or settlers and everyone else, we always emulate the colonizer. Now it's more accessible for more privileged Black Indigenous people of color to travel maybe from the U.S. or places in the global north. It's replicating the same thing because who else do we have to look to when it comes to migration around the world? It's all informed by the same narrative. So we just copy the same shit. I'm reminded of this very old speech from the 60s of a man named Ivan Illich, who was a Catholic priest at the time and was in charge of facilitating the mission, the renewed mission of the Catholic Church in Latin America at the time. And he was asked to give a speech in front of these American Peace Corps students in the United States who were set to go travel to Mexico for the summer to basically share the good word, right, of this kind of secularized missionary worldview with the people. And Illich referred to them, and I imagine in the mid 60s, people in the Peace Corps, I could be wrong, but I imagine the vast majority of those students being white, right? But he referred to them as cultural Americans and not Americans, not white, right? And this stuck with me for so long because, as you're kind of saying, in the sense of always being in relationship to the colonizing force, you know, and I think for, for Illich, he was kind of getting at that. The basis of the dominant culture is that colonialism, right? And so in the context of travel writing and the way that our colonialist attitudes show up subtly, overtly, et cetera, is it possible to identify in that context decolonial attitudes? And secondly, if it is possible, what do you think some of those major characteristics or hallmarks are of decolonial writing or what decolonial writing could look like or does look like? I wouldn't put decolonial in front of writing. I wouldn't do that. It's too easy, right? Mm. What are the right words? I mean, we're speaking in English, right? Like we're already limited in many ways. 
So it's an ongoing understanding of ourselves, of place, of history, and everything shifting. You know, our identities and place are always in flux. So these are constant, consistent questions in colonization. It's more about dismantling, right? Than kind of just like going to solutions or what is the good way to do this versus the bad way to do this. Tourism is all kind of bad. It's all capitalism. <laughs> mm. So we're starting from a fucked up place all the time. Uh, <laughs> that's how I feel. And I like to say that travel writing needs to go, undergo an identity crisis. Like it needs to be chaotic because it's too comfortable. We don't want to put a decolonial bow on violence. <laughs> so that's a little too black and white, but some frameworks that I look at that exist, you know, might be small and might be large. You know, one is subversion. Subversion is very important to me because some examples of subversion of travel writing really turn everything on its head and they are kind of directly anti-tourism. They're kind of directly challenging tourism as a front-facing evil <laughs> and also complex. One of those books, uh, Jaya Rune Ravine, The Romance of Siam, is a subverted travel guide to Thailand. They're trans biracial Thai person and that book incorporates performance art and poetry and uses kind of like forwarders and movies about Thailand from the West to make fun of it. Something that they say Jai is they want the Orientalist to look at himself. So that's kind of what subverting does. If you can put a mirror on that and not bury the fucking lead, not being nice or anything. They're just an artist. They're not, Jai doesn't work in tourism. Jai doesn't have a stake in this going on. And that is very essential to me. If you have a stake in tourism continuing, if you are just like, I'm going to travel the rest of my life and I just want to do it in a good way, you're not going to be against it. And I'm not saying I'm not a tourist. I'm not saying that these things are easy. We're really just talking about the writing aspect of it. So I think subversion is very important to again look at the self look at how all of the images from movies and the guidebooks and the textbooks and the mercator maps we have a distorted worldview from birth right let me talk about it mariam kaba who is an abolitionist co-wrote this little zine it's a pdf that you can get for free and it tracks the radical black woman of the harlem renaissance in harlem so it's a self-guided tour. It just shows you what the places are. And it's a cool zine that goes into just a little bit of the histories of all those women there. Because even when we talk about the Harlem Renaissance, it focuses on men a lot. And it's just so fascinating. There's a number of ways why that is non-invasive. First of all, when it comes to Black women, I think the people who are most interested about learning that history are Black women. So I don't think it attracts like a lot of privileged white people mm. and the rest of us. So the problem with that would be bringing in an influx of foreigners and stuff and not in the bad way, but, you know, outsiders to a place which immediately changes the real estate or immediately rises the rents, like immediately makes the place a tourist destination, which Harlem is already, you know, super gentrified. This is New York. But that kind of way that whether it's like a radical tour, this or that, you're bringing in people. When you bring in outside people, it signals that shit's changing and all of that. However, in most of those places in the zine, there is no plaque. That A lot of the houses are just replaced by parking lots and nice restaurants. It's not a pretty tourist destination. You're going just to honor them and be where they were and go to those stomping grounds. That is just a way that I think is non-invasive and is more restorative because it doesn't focus on Black trauma as much as it educates on what these women did to liberate their people, many as writers, many of them were writers and mm -hmm. activists, and in their time recovered and restored other silenced and erased stories of Black women, all the histories of resistance. When we focus most on trauma and what wasn't there, it's like no one made things, no one fought for better. And those stories are erased. And it's really important to learn that history. And you can do it in non-invasive ways. You can just read the zine and learn those things without having to go, et cetera. Mm. 
Oh, just a few things. I look at subversion. I look at detours of Decolonial Guides of Hawaii, edited by Bernadette Vicuña Gonzalez and Hokuluni K. I. Cal. And instead of being a guide to traveling in Hawaii, it's a guide to decolonization movement in Hawaii and an anthology of all these different ways of looking in place, which is what it is. So I love that also as a way that is not invitational, that is based in mm -hmm. reading other people's stories and not having to insert ourselves in that story or in that place. You know, can't we just be in relationship to how people are relating to their place and why do we need to be there? Why do we need to be a part of it? Um, and why do we even need to be the people who write about it? Sometimes we just mm. need to read and shut up and stay put. Mm. That's a lot. Minimal. And I would love to see them just grow more. Yeah, absolutely. This notion, generally speaking, is kind of a general term or maybe quantum physics, but I've heard Bayouko Malafi speak to it a fair amount. This notion of entanglement and the colonial mindset and the colonial culture and colonial history, that there's no just stepping outside of it with the snap of a fingers, right? And that this work is really the work of many lifetimes. And you did mention you didn't want to necessarily put this decolonial label on things because it's too easy. And I wanted to ask you in this regard, because here in Oaxaca, a place that a lot of travelers and tourists come to for quote unquote cultural tourism in order to see, experience, consume culture, I'm reminded of a poster that I saw for a tour agency on the street a couple of years ago, and it said something to the degree of authentic, sustainable, heritage, rejuvenative, native experiences. But like just like that, five or seven different adjectives that were all just kind of hitting those marks, right? It's this incredible degree of greenwashing, for lack of a better word, that we see in the, especially as tourism has returned in the last two years of people wanting to get things right by not necessarily risking the bottom line or their businesses in order to do so. And so we see a lot of this regenerative, rejuvenative, sustainable, et cetera, echo. And I'm wondering if personally I've seen any kind of greenwashing in regards to decoloniality and what might be the consequence to this, this decolonizing project, if we start to use that term flippantly. The status quo always subsumes language that comes from radical movements in order to placate folks and to slow those movements down. Like those motherfuckers taking the knee, it's like the aesthetics of radical movements if you take that and language is also aesthetic it can be if you take those things then you can actually continue to justify capitalism and the same exact business by using maybe what they see as evolving language so i mean from a strictly capitalist point of view it's obviously little buzzwords so that people can buy shit you know it's always looking at who the market is right now. And they're looking at, especially 2020, you know, Black Lives Matter. They're like, oh, this is a moment. We should change some of our language or put up some bullshit thing about how we're going to do better. Unfortunately, a lot of people thought that that was sufficient. It's travel writing. It's the most colonized genre. It's just all about selling more stuff. So that's okay. And even if some people have good intentions and stuff, you want money. <laughs> so you don't want tourism to stop because it's too much. Um, in some places, it's too much. And if it continues, it's always going to be too much. It never becomes less. And when it does, it only shows that tourism economies are fucking evil, <laughs> completely unsustainable, and in a form of neo-imperialism. So it's about weakening those movements by assuming that language and appropriating it. That is always the point of taking that even if folks, again, are doing with good intentions and are part of these things and they want to be like, I want to start this new thing. You have folks, you know, of all kinds starting their own things. And again, it cannot always be black and white, but it has the same roots a lot of the time. There's so many rebrandings of tourism that speak to this. 
ethical tourism, sustainable travel, eco travel, transformative tourism, restorative tourism, decolonial tourism, solidarity tourism. I've seen all these words at least in the past year. I think it just goes back to what I said about it being too easy. I'm not doing colonial tourism. I'm doing solidarity tourism. I'm doing ecotourism. I study this, right? So I know all the complexities there. Like I know good frameworks, great frameworks, you know, tension. I know about those entanglements. I'm saying we're consistently rebranding the same shit. You know, Mm -hmm. I don't like my social media or any of my presence (laughs) to be like, I hate bad tourists. You know, bad white guys, they're annoying, you know, go with their Ganesha tattoos to places where that's illegal and then complain, you know, or haggling in East Asia like you suck. Eh, I don't let myself off the hook. It's not about the bad ones. Because it's more to me about systemic issues and not just individual intent. And I know that that is kind of at the heart of putting those words in front of tourism. I think most of those terms come from people who recognize the issues there and want it to be a little bit better. Obviously, it's coming from a horrible place. So I think it has a lot to do with placation. I think it has a lot to do with people kind of progressing and thinking deeper about these things. But there is a rush to make money off of it and to rebrand it. And I just think it's too easy. I think if I kind of talk about these things outwardly, you know, I'll get people who are like, yeah, I'm a traveler, not a tourist. And I travel to learn. I hate those tours. And I'm just like, you're a tourist. It's okay. I'm a tourist. It's not a bad word to me. And travel is not a good word to me. So call it whatever you want. It's all tourism. And if that's something that you're really interested in and you want to look in, it's really important to look at the research. There's a lot of companies that put out papers and studies and do on the ground kind of studies and talking to people about these things. And you can read those things and you can just go to the website and say, who owns this shit? I look at their faces and I'm like, I don't, hmm. you know, it's all white women. It's all white women who went here. Her life changed. Now she wants to do this. She has a B Corp, blah, blah, blah. Same shit. It's all the same. <laughs> Most of it is the same. And if it's coming from a ministry of tourism, if it's coming from a corporation, You have a stake in tourism. You have a stake in business as usual. The usual would just be a little bit prettier. And maybe those things can be temporarily good, but they only continue harm. It doesn't erase. We don't go back in time when it Mm. comes to ecological destruction, domination, colonialism. Look at Malawi. Look at Mozambique. Look at Hawaii. It's not going backwards. Machu Picchu is not going to rebuild itself. Like there's too many people on Everest, period. It's melting. I don't like the rebranding of things because I think we want to think it's something completely different when usually it's like some of the money goes to this little group and that's kind of it. I think the greatest danger in appropriating language from movements that are about tangible change and radical restructuring, and we're talking about dissolving of the settler state you know, rematriating the land and cultures of people and reparations. If we have those reparations, a lot of people wouldn't be able to tour all these places anymore. I think the biggest danger of that is the idea of reformism. And you cannot reform colonialism. Tourism is the leisurely face of colonialism. And it is not challenged as an inherent good and inevitability. It's like people are going to travel. So what do we do? And the same with colonialism. It's like, you know, why are we going to decolonize when we can, you know, reform the cops, reform prison, reform capitalism, Mm -hmm. reform America? You can't do that. So, of course, this country loves the words, I have a dream. And it loves some things when they become popularized to the point where then it can become appropriated. And so I think the biggest danger of taking, being inspired or informed a little bit by radical language and some of those frameworks and trying to apply it to such a destructive industry as tourism um, makes it seem better, makes people want to do it more. Because then it's like, now I can be involved in decolonial tourism. It just furthers harm. And I guess at the end of the day, it's extremely, extremely difficult to to see how one's consequence in a place actually ripples out over it when They've gone home. 
And speaking of, you know, speaking of this, something that kind of hits close to home a little bit is this notion of spiritual tourism. You wrote about extremely eloquently in a beautiful essay from 2019 entitled The Heart of Whiteness on Spiritual Tourism and the Colonization of Ayahuasca. And it hit home in part because I had some drug issues back in the day and decided to head down to the Amazon you know, about 10 years ago in order to get clean. And, you know, it really helped. It certainly really helped. But um, I guess in the years that followed, there was a lot of friends who I met there and friends from other places who had done similar things and maybe not for the same reasons. But I started to see mostly on social media, the kind of growth of this spiritual or psychedelic tourism and its relative consequences on the places and people that bore the brunt of it in places like the Amazon basin. And so I'm wondering, given that this essay that you wrote, and I'll make sure for our listeners that it's up on the website once the podcast is launched, given that it was written in 2019, some four years ago, I'm wondering how much of what you wrote about has changed since then? And also, what drove you to write it in the first place? Spiritual tourism, same shit, different day. With colonialism, everything is up for grabs. With tourism, everything is up for grabs. Every single thing. Mm. And herbs, things that grow out of the earth, people, their time and entry, all of it is up for grabs. If you pay for a flight, if you pay for a tour, you feel entitled to everything, you know? Even if you exist and you have power in your blood, there is no questioning the entitlement of travel and everything that comes with place. It drives misogyny very much and gender depression because women are seen, especially Black and, and Native women, are seen as part of the land. And well, this goes one into one of the tropes that I think is so latent in spiritual tourism, the heart of whiteness. Which of course, is a play on Joseph Conrad's The Heart of Darkness. Hmm. Before, when I was talking about contact narratives and scientific racism and putting people in this imaginary place of inferiority in, in order to create a narrative of domination by design, when they did that, that's a very negative and fucked up view of looking at people, right? But then there's the opposite of like, oh my God, like these shamans, they just know everything and they're so wise and connected to the earth and not like, us. you know, I need to unplug and I'm so, you know, mired in the grind, the nine to five. So I want to go to these people who are basically, in my mind, prehistoric motherfuckers, primitive assholes who don't live in a contemporary world of struggle and capitalism and who are free from modernity and Wi-Fi connections because they have no technology, <laughs> they are backwards and live in a forest, and therefore they're wiser and smarter and more connected to the origin of land and people. It's the same thing, but in a nice way, in a positive way. And even I want to point out in some folks talking about colonizing travel, we are, I think we're starting to do the same thing with very leftist folks, like, I want to learn from the natives and I want to learn about ayahuasca. It goes by many names in the Amazon. Um, and I want to respect these people and be around them. And it's still a little bit of putting them in a superior place, you know, again, of the noble S word. So it's the same kind of narrative of people being um, uncivilized, but in a way that they can consume that will better your life. Mm. So I want to take this stuff from the stupid people who haven't changed in thousands of years for me. So ayahuasca and all kind of medicines is very fucking specific because it comes from one place. It's a pretty big place, the Amazon, but it comes from one place. Mm. So there's a lot to talk about, but let's forward to I know you talked about your experience. I don't descend from Amazonian people. I talk about that in the piece. After years of struggling with that and so many friends being like, what's wrong with you? You are in 
a dark place all the time. <laughs> you need to do this. All my friends were indigenous from the Amazon. And so I had seen this culture for years of the spiritual tourists with their dreadlocks and shit and their artesanias and all their weed and like, ooh, this is going to be a cure. That is the problem with appropriation. From a Western lens, it is always taking a new trend, whether it be quinoa, acai, you got ayahuasca, you got different forms of things that can be used to better one individual's life if they want, or just to use to have fun or whatever, because they can. That is really, really the point. What it does is it takes something very complex and specific that exists in its context and makes it into a miracle. You know, mm-hmm. ayahuasca is going to cure you. You don't need medicine. You don't need surgery. You know, you don't need therapy. You are going to be cured by this magic substance that is growing magically from the earth. So when you take something out of its context, it's always making it this special magical thing rather than just something that a lot of people do habitually to commune with the rainforest, which is where a lot of people's ancestors are in the Amazon. My point before of specificity of the fact that it's so far from you is I understand the science of DMT. You can find that in many other places. What's wrong with shrooms? What's wrong with LSD? Did you get bored? Is this just more exotic? Go somewhere in a field and find some shrooms, like leave the Amazon alone. Why do you think that something that's buried in the earth and the opposite side of the world is going to fix you? Like that lack of culture, any lack of culture, because that's what settler colonialism does to a lot of us, is separate us from that root. And I think white folks, you know, I can put myself in there, you know, it's, we're all racialized, are the furthest from the source. They're the furthest mm. from the spirit, mm. they're the furthest from being a part of a culture, having any relationship to land. So when you see land as just a place that you are, instead of having any relationship to it, you're going to just think, well, that's over there and I can buy it and I can get it and I can do it. I can do it for really cheap and I can do it in these white fucking yoga Gaia places in the heart of Peru. It's so separated from the origin that it's just like, why would you do this in Brooklyn? Like, What's your problem? It's just regular medicine for people. It's a part of their culture and their life for thousands of thousands of years. It's not this new thing for you. And I don't know how something that is from so far away is going to heal you. You can easily have that experience somewhere else, period. And even if you don't think you can, you think going to this part of Ecuador is the only thing that can help you with your alcoholism, you're wrong. But go, you're not going to stop. They're not. If there's money to be made off of something, there's going to be no end. We saw that with cotton. We saw that with this. We saw that with quinoa. It's bad. (laughs) <laughs> it only destroys kind of cultures because it's not just what it's doing to them economically, but it's what it does to folks culturally. You get to take a part of this. You don't have to deal with any of the history, any of the future. And instead of communing with something that is more specific to your culture, whatever the fuck that is, and your land, whatever the fuck that is, to better you on an individual level, you are refusing healing on a community level. And that's the only Mm. level that it can be done in. That is what ayahuasca is for. You know, a lot of people are just messing with very sacred things that they don't understand. It's just so you can feel a little bit better. You can go to therapy. You can take medication. It's not evil. We all need access to medicine. So why would you go so far to, to deal with that? Get some LSD from your dealer and leave the Amazon alone. Amen. Yeah, I mean, that's fascinating. And for me, one of the things you said about you know, this notion of individual healing versus communal healing, I think is so important. Because even if these plants have been used at present or in the past for communal healing among the people who have stewarded them, traditionally, the immersion into a place for a week or two weeks or a month or however long, without any kind of cultural or historical background as to where you are and when you are, et cetera, and then returning on a plane to this place and culture and kind of ground of being that that allowed or permitted your illness or your disease to have a place in your life is a sign that, you know, well, first of all, you're, you're returning to that illness, 
you're returning to that disease because maybe it is an individual, maybe it's communal. And then secondly, that there's not necessarily going to be anyone there to actually understand what you've just gone through and all the consequences around that. And so this notion of communal healing reminds me a little bit of what might have been possible during these lockdown times at the beginning of the pandemic in 2020 and 2021. I know a lot of people were, weren't were legally allowed to, to leave their house and that this could have been a huge moment for change. And so with tourism, it's fascinating because for among the people that I've interviewed who live in these really over-touristed places, suddenly having zero tourism and no tourists, they had the opportunity to kind of take back their cities or their towns, their communal spaces. And then, of course, starting in late 2021, that started as a change with government restrictions being lifted and travel and tourism beginning to resume. And so I'm curious, I'd like to ask you, I guess, from your point of view, what you saw, I guess, maybe perhaps in the place that you were living in, and then also globally, the consequences of the grounding of travel, first of all, on local geographies and and cultures, and then your response to uh, how you saw the return or revenge of tourism once it did start to come back. Tourism didn't disappear in 2020. It didn't stop mad people. It didn't stop them. And it wasn't illegal anywhere. I mean, of course, there's ways to get into borders when you're white and rigid. (laughs) You can do anything with money. A lot of people didn't stop at all. At all. Weren't vaccinated. Didn't wear a mask. Didn't care. Weren't stopped. You could leave your home. The cops didn't stop you. That just didn't happen. So I guess it slowed down a lot, you know, for health reasons for a lot of people. But it didn't stop. Tourism never stops because people don't stay home. And that's the problem. I think since the beginning of the pandemic, it has only really made the oppression much more stark and power differences much more stark, you know, between these different places people are coming from and going to. You can never stop tourists. It's not going to (laughs) happen. It only gets worse, I always say. So... With what people call revenge tourism, which is disgusting, it was stronger and better than ever. Everything is just like, oh, we can go back out and I can't wait till we go back out and I hate doing virtual stuff and we all want to leave, you know, because I, I do, you know, courses with, with travelers and travel writers. What it really shows, and this is why Hawaii is such a prime example of everything wrong with travel culture and tourism and, and all of its types of colonialism, it's the same thing, is that people don't have limits and they don't see limits. Mm. Everything is up for grabs. The whole world is yours. Anything. There is no limit in a colonial world. There's always more. And tourism is that that monster that eats and eats and eats. You can eat the herb and you can eat the clothes and you can eat the people and all the shit. People are hungry for that consumption because travelers can't stay still. And that's one of their biggest problems in society period, especially with that, where it was like, can we sit for five minutes? Because a lot Mm. of people have been being reckless as fuck for three years because they were home for like two weeks in 2020. Mm. Like you didn't stop. You weren't masking. Shut up. You weren't testing. Tests were not widely available. Vaccines were not widely available. And then you're traveling to places, even if you were vaccinated, where most of those people aren't vaccinated and they don't have the infrastructure to deal with all of these sick motherfuckers who should have stayed home where they do have access to things, even though millions and millions of people are dying because of this pandemic who are already mad vulnerable and are still dying. And people are still traveling without maps and talking about ethical travel on TikTok. Like all these precedents already existed. So what tourism does is just make it seem worse and very obvious. Um, So when I bring up Hawaii, I have a lecture called Wanderlust. And that that word is so exemplary to me with what I'm saying right now. The lust for place. The traveler cannot restrain themselves. They want no matter what. If someone says no, you keep going. I think what the pandemic shows us is that we can't stay still. The settler can't stay still. And escaping whiteness, which is what I think comes to the spiritual tourism part, where it's like, I need to escape privilege. Like, 
Mm. I have a steady job. I go home. I can commute home. I have my family. I make too much money. I buy the same shit. Every day is monotonous. I am too privileged. That's what I call the heart of whiteness because you're trying to escape whiteness. And a lot of people, when we see, you know, 2020 or other things that happen, it's like, why do you guys live in the U.S.? The U.S. sucks. All this mass shootings and stuff. Just leave. You yeah. can't outrun the U.S. <laughs> right? There's a famous Spanish language meme, you know, visit the United States before the United States visits you in a military way. But yeah, we can't outrun privilege. Like you're just taking it wherever you go and making everywhere worse. You know, Mexico was one of the only places in the world that never had any uh, travel restrictions on people coming in in terms of, you know, in terms of anything, vaccines, uh, anything. And uh, so we had in Oaxaca, maybe one, maybe two months of uh, empty streets and then the restrictions were starting to be lifted a little bit and then by september 2021 there was a good amount of people in the streets local and foreign but you could tell very very easily who was local and who was foreign and you know there was two manners of doing it one was more or less skin color but the other one was that all the locals were wearing masks and none of the foreigners were now, I should put a little footnote or asterisk in that because the local expats, most of them anyways, were wearing masks. And so it was easy to kind of note the tourists as opposed to the expats. But anyways, I won't get into that too much. So in this context of finding ways not just to stay home, but to honor place, to confront the inner colonizer, as you mentioned earlier, and perhaps to even gear travel writing towards the movements that we have in place. And so I'm curious, what kind of possibilities do you think exist for a craft like travel writing if it was utilized in the context of one's own place? I think of the deep ecology movements and how this craft is typically considered quote unquote, nature writing, among other things, and not travel writing. And so can we travel in place in our own homes and neighborhoods? Or am I just putting too much weight on, on the language, on semantics? No, I am very specific about language because it matters so much. We're always traveling. Like I said, we all, almost all of us are products of travel or have dealt with the brunt of travel as many indigenous people as Faith Adeli. Faith Adeli, she leads BIPOC travel writing classes, the first in the nation. She always says BIPOC, Black indigenous people of color are the most traveled and the most visited people on earth. Every time we leave home, we travel. And I've always think of the root of movement. Like I said, I can't get on the train. There's no elevator anywhere near me, so I can barely leave my neighborhood. And navigating place and obstacles in place of community gathering and self-determination. So no matter what, whether I'm going to the corner or I'm going across the world, those conditions are always in place. And I'm always contending with them and I'm always representative in them in my body. Right. Mm. Um, and the way the leverage that my power and my privilege hold is going to shift around the world and in the spaces that I am. So it's very important for all of us when it comes to writing to go again, look at the self and locate where you are within that hierarchy of power, those permanent ones and the ones that shift. So we have to consistently have an understanding, have an analysis of power and especially how it functions globally. So a lot of US Americans are going to listen to this and please think about the rest of the world. <laughs> When it comes to anti-imperialism, nothing is getting better in this country anywhere until, you know, U.S. American imperialism stops this shit. And even then, we can't go back in time. So I want to challenge people to think about dismantling capitalism and decolonization, not as to be cheesy a destination, but a journey that is going to cure everything. I have a great talk with Hokuluni Keikau, the co-editor of D Sports Decolonial Guide to Hawaii, and Alan Paleos Lopez who is a Black Indigenous femme, also near Oaxaca. Do you know Alan? No, I don't. They're migrant scribble online, and we had this conversation based in a decolonial future. Mm -hmm. And 
what did everything look like there and how we were contending with the same problems in this future where destruction has already happened. It's in the architectural review, if you all want to look it up. Every, every way that we move is politicized, is political. And understanding systemic issues is going to show people how that applies to everything. And I know that can seem overwhelming things, but again, instead of having a top-down understanding of things, if we really look at the root of power and domination, we will see all the traces as it manifests in our life and all of our decisions. It is all-encompassing. That's why I talk about travel, because I think it is all-encompassing. And it Mm. is at the heart of colonialism and it's the heart of decolonization. So those narratives are out there. When I talk about travel, when I use that word very intentionally, I'm talking about all kinds of travel. I'm talking about immigration. I'm talking about the transatlantic slave trade, talking about colonialism and studying abroad and Peace Corps and human trafficking, (laughs) exile and refugee status. I'm thinking about undocumented people, all of that, everyone being shifted. You know, I really don't like to center my shit on whiteness and how people can do better at things that I have never had access to anyway. How am I going to tell you how to have an ethical career? Shut up. (laughs) I've never been on one. Trouble writing in your home neighborhood already exists. There's a great book, Beyond Guilt Trips, Mindful Travel in an Unequal World, Dr. Anu Taranath. She was on your podcast, right? That's right. That's right. And one of the little workbook sections that she has, I use in all my travel writing classes. And it's just asking these questions about what do you share with others and how do you do so? And what's available for you to share with others? And one answer to that may be like a privileged white person. The avenues that you have to publish your thoughts on anything or anywhere are plentiful. You have all the magazines, you have all the blogs, you have your phone at your fingertips to be kind of a mouthpiece for a place that you just went to. Or even if you lived there for a few years, you still, expats are still annoying. (laughs) I say that, I don't know, whatever you want to call me. And one thing she brings up is what are the stories about that place that you are that already exist and Mm. that you don't have to contend to? So it is very important that read stories about where you are now and other places. I mean, if I wanted to read about a place, I would not go to the travel writing section of a bookstore. Hello? You know, so that travel writing already exists. It exists in performance, in poetry, in academic writing, in tweets. You know, I, I bring all this together in novels and in short stories and in nonfiction. It shouldn't just be travel logs. It shouldn't just be a touristic point of view. But like I said in the beginning of this talk, my shelves were lined with travel writing by people of color. They're just not called that because people who travel mm. are rich people who leave to go abroad, not people who have had to travel or had a little bit of privilege like my family to travel because at some point you have to leave. Mm -hmm. It's all this displacement. It's all this shifting of people around the world. If we don't trace that back, you're just going to be continuing to do the same thing. And it's all about the mindset of entitlement and not being able to stay still, which is very much the heart of coloniality. Learning about your own place and seeing the stories that already exist about this place. So I would engage with those writings outside of the genre that we see as trouble writing, which is just super limited and go outside of that. I have a whole syllabus, which is very short. There's just so much more. My vast majority of my adult life has been tracking down, you know, BIPOC travel writing that might not be called that. That includes nature writing, that includes nature poetry and all those things. If it's about Identity, power, migration, I'm interested. And, uh, you know, and those novels and that poetry talk so much more to the transformative power of travel, positive and negative. You know, the trauma of migration and being stolen from your home and put in this brand new world. It tells us everything about everything. That writing exists. You can look for it. You have to look outside of this travel culture tourism thing and find them. Obviously, learning different languages always helps. We have so many folks online from so many different parts of the world who might be able to lead you to that writing, or you can look on social media. I love reading how people 
experience place, especially black, black and brown people visiting black and brown people and all of the entanglements and all the tensions. That's my favorite thing, that tension. <laughs> Because it tells us about everything and travel writing can be beautiful. It already is, but we have to stop centering whiteness and how whiteness is bad and how whiteness is good and go to those original stories and go to those stories of now that are contended with all these things. I mean, there's so many books that are, you know, understanding home, understanding the self, the mess that is travel and migration and geopolitics. And I don't think we can make sense of it, but we can be present wherever we are. And that is the most important thing, wherever you are. Don't think about these things when you travel. Think about it right now, wherever you are. And I hope that informs, and that should inform, how you move about the world. Yeah. Mm, beautiful, beautiful. Well, what a rich and incredibly nourishing conversation. And it's a, it's a very deep honor to be able to have you on the podcast before we say our farewells today how might our listeners find out more about your your work your writing and your writing workshops googling me is is probably one of the best ways so i'm on instagram at bani amor b-a-n-i-a-m-o-r and that's where i more quickly post my events and courses and stuff i usually just post my writing Maybe I talk too much shit in my stories, but I take big breaks from it. But I will be back soon to share my upcoming writing courses with the Hudson Valley Writing Writer Center that is dismantling coloniality, dismantling the inner colonizer. You know what I mean? It's not about the same shit, but mm. it's very dense. Trust me. <laughs> so, yeah, I'm very excited to always talk about these things with new folks and have these conversations. So you can look at my Instagram for that. Bonnie Amort is on TikTok which I'm just running my mouth on these things in very short ways. But again, I take breaks from that. Google me, Bonnie Amorta. You'll find a lot of my pieces. You can Google Bonnie Amorta Linktree. So yeah, Google me, check out the Hudson Valley Writer Center and I'll be doing some other stuff. I'm currently organizing a virtual BIPOC travel reading so you can get into a mm. lot of this diasporic original shit. So check me out online. Well, congratulations on the new course. And uh I will make sure that all of those links are on the Editor of Tourism website when the episode launches. And, uh, you know, thank you again so much for your time. I'm really grateful for your generosity in that regard and for being able to tease out so many threads out of these really complex themes. And I think that's the goal of the pod, but, you know, it's always great when it's done on such a, in such a succinct way. So thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you for calling what I did succeed. But, but yeah, thank you so much. Yeah, this is great. Thanks for listening, everyone. For more, you can check out the homework section under each episode on our website at theendoftourism.com. We'd also like to offer a deep bow of gratitude for our patrons who ensure that the project keeps growing and so that all of you can listen without a paywall. In this way, we participate in the gift economy and invite you to do the same via our Patreon page at patreon.com slash theendoftourism. Likewise, you can follow us on social media via the handle The End of Tourism. Until next time, farewell, friends. <laughs>